Hi and welcome to episode 31 of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Derek. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Page One Podcast where we speak to writers of all kinds about their work, their writing process and try and get as many hints and tips as possible. This is in fact the last episode of the current series but uh, we hope to be back very very soon because I know that Many people have time on their hands at the moment, <laughs> being trapped in their houses. So, uh, which hopefully won't go for much longer. We have but... nothing better to do other than chat to people ourselves. So That's we've already true. got a couple in in the bank for next season. We do indeed, we do indeed. So yeah, we we will be back with great episodes very soon. But before that, we've got a great episode for you today. Who's we our guest, do. Tarek? We have Laura Lamb, who is a sci-fi and fantasy author. She's a Californian. However, she moved, she left that horrible, sunny Hollywood yeah. Why to, come over to, to there? <laughs> come over to rainy Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, and she's an author, but she also, also teaches creative writing at uh, Napier University here in Edinburgh, Yeah, which we chatted to her about. Yeah, we did. I thought that was really interesting, actually, uh, just hearing mm-hmm. about the way that the course is approached and all the useful stuff it gives you it's really worth hearing her chat about that if you're interested in writing um, and yeah. we also talk about her latest book which is called goldilocks and which is pitched as i think the martian meets the handmaid's tale and i would also say via interstellar as well um it's it's we've both been lucky enough to read it it's actually out at the end of the month as we chat with uh, at the end of april sorry which we chat with Laura about, um, but I thought it was a great book. I have to say, yeah, yeah, I really, really liked it. It's mm-hmm. a kind of, um, I mean, I think the sea, you know, the Martian, Hammy Steel, and Stellar. I think those are perfect kind of kind of touch points for it. And it is very much in that vein. Yeah, it's just it's a it's a really good uh, tense kind of drama, and it's a low key f- story. Although it's a sci fi story, it's not a big massive, you know, Star Wars type galaxy. Like no. it's a very close drama what happens on this spaceship as it travels and yeah it's, it's really good it is it's, it's really really worth reading so do pick that up and we actually talked to her as well about the difficulties of releasing a book at this particular <laughs> yeah. time because when we're recording it um unfortunately coronavirus is still running rampant and we're all locked up in our houses so obviously she can't have the usual type of book launch and we chat to her about that as well so it's a really interesting chat um mm-hmm. and we'll uh, get on with it but first we're just going to play a quick advert for our writer's notebook which is a special notebook that we've designed to help you plan your next story and we'll be back at the end of the podcast with some more chat and some more info about our plans for the future enjoy the blank page to some it's terrifying an obstacle to overcome But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a 
comic or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Did you always want to be a writer? Uh, I think I did, yeah, once I realized it was a job that you could actually do. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd always worked for it, but I always thought it was going to be sort of, you know, the second background success story. So I had all these other grand plans that were equally unrealistic. At one point, I wanted to play a gold-plated flute in the San Francisco Symphony. So that was nice. incredibly specific. <laughs> wanted to be a ballerina. Um, and then I gradually got more practical. I thought maybe I'd be a lawyer, and then I realized that was not for me. And I just kept cycling through. And eventually, no. yeah, could... then eventually, I was like, I'm just, I'm going to try. I'm going to go for writing. So I did. Excellent. And um, so, what was the, what were the, your first steps towards doing that then? Uh, so I did my undergrad in California, and I did English literature and creative writing. Um, and I had a lot of fun, but none of my teachers were super into science fiction and fantasy. Um, so I ended up learning from them, but mostly just kind of learning by doing. So my first uh, job was right after I graduated, I moved to Scotland because my um, husband is Scottish and I'm Californian and we were long distance for five years. So I could wow. finally <laughs> not be long distance. I did, I did wonder what the reason was to leave, you know, all the oh, sunshine to come over oh, to yeah. It's Scotland. an incredibly nerdy story where basically we argued about books when I was 15 and he was 16. Um, and then we started writing absolutely terrible books together. Um, <laughs> well, his was actually okay. Mine mine had like, the first line was, the sunset was as red as blood. I still remember it was about like cat people and fairies. It was not good. Um, but yeah, so I moved to Scotland and then kind of struggled, you know, to find my first job. Um, and I got a job working at a law firm back when I briefly thought I wanted to be a lawyer and that quickly disabused me of that notion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I decided uh, I, over my lunch break, I would start writing. Um, so I started playing around with it. And then after work was finished, I would go to Starbucks for an hour and a half until it closed. And usually Craig would meet me there and we would both write and eat cinnamon rolls. Uh, so I really slowly started writing my first book, um, which was not the first book that was published, but it had the same main character, but 10 years older. Um, and I kept getting stuck. So I decided to write a short story about the character as a teenager and then 300,000 words later I got slightly <laughs> carried away <laughs> so that became my first book was that pantomime pump? yeah, I was say. yeah. And so I uh I submitted that uh to Angry Robots Open Door Month way back in 2011 which feels very far away now and uh I didn't really expect anything to happen I just thought you know I'm proud of myself for trying let's give it a go and I made some really good friends that I'm still in contact with we all kind of bonded together uh over the other people who submitted that year and they eventually got back to me with a full request um and I did the like terrible early writer uh mistake of submitting a not quite finished manuscript oh. Which, because I was I was 21, I think I didn't know what I was doing at all. So, but luckily, by the time they asked for the full manuscript, I had finished something, but it wasn't exactly polished. So I was really frantically like giving it a last polish before I sent it off. Uh, and then there were five, I think, angsty-filled months while I waited to hear back, or less than that. I think it was June they requested the full manuscript, and then in November they were like, well. It's good, except for all this stuff that's terribly wrong with it. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay, that's fair. And so um, I got a revise and resubmit request. Oh, that's quite good to get. Yeah, right? yeah. That's a sign that they would like your work a lot enough to yes. give a second chance. Yeah, so they were basically like, you're on the way. We really like the concept, but try again. Um, and we want to see how you can actually respond to the editorial mm -hmm. notes. So I did that, and I did a completely, like, ground up rewrite basically over three months where um it was it turned into being non-linear it got 25 percent longer i actually added magic because for a fantasy book it had surprisingly little magic um and just deepened it and really i think that's when i really sort of learned to kind of professionalize my practice really and so then i sent it back to them and then i had one of those like very dream-filled weeks where like i sent it around I sent it back to Angry Robot, and they said they were going to bring it to acquisitions. That was on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. 
Meanwhile, I'd been querying agents and an agent got back to me um, that same day because I said, this book's going to acquisitions at a publisher on Thursday. Like, do you want to read it? And she got back to me five <laughs> minutes later and was like, yeah, sure. And then an hour wow. later, she, yeah, an hour later, she was like, I'm really enjoying it. And then the next day she was like, let's have a phone call. And this is the Wednesday. And that was Juliet Mushins, who's now my, still my agent. Uh, so we had a, a conversation. And what I liked is she was like, I want to sign you whether or not this publisher offers. Brilliant. Um, and so then they offered on Thursday <laughs> and I accepted Juliet's offer on Friday. And then I was just left being like, what? What just happened? <laughs> That's like the dream what week. Happened? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was what a roller coaster. Yeah. So that was a good week. So. So um, why did you? So why did you choose not to go to the agent first? What What was your thoughts about going to the publisher? It was just because I didn't really know how publishing worked, and I was like, "Oh, this is open. Let's give it a go." I've heard mm-hmm. it's really hard to get an agent, and I might not get one with this weird book about a magic circus with an intersex protagonist. So <laughs> let's see what happens. So, so do you think having that kind of push almost onto the agent by saying look you've got a deadline now you know there's something's happening does that help was that a helpful speeding things along a little bit yeah it put me to the top of the pile just because they're like well i may as well take a look um and i've had a couple other agents interested too but i went with juliet um i didn't get to the phone call stage with any of the others but i just really really clicked with juliet and i could tell she really understood what I was trying to do and she was interested in my other book ideas. So um, I was really happy that I went with her and I'd always wanted to have an agent because I know that they're so good at getting you better book deals and dealing with the difficult things and kind of having someone in your corner. Cause especially at 21, I, I didn't know what publishing was. I didn't really know how to advocate for myself. Um, I'm, I'm a lot bullshier now than I was back then. And when you got the notes back to, to sort of say from angry robot to say we like this but revise it and stuff like that was there everything did you agree with everything that they said to you or did that just cause you to stand back and then think it, think I, it out yourself yeah, i pretty well? much agreed with everything i knew that something was wrong and i'd already kind of figured out a way to fix it because my friend ann lyle who's an angry robot author she wrote an elizabethan trilogy um i'm blanking on the first one but people should look up ann lyle because okay. they're great Um, And she was like, it's a book about a circus, but the circus doesn't actually show up until like a third of the way through the book. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's a good point. And she said, have you, have you thought about making it nonlinear? And I was like, oh, that's perfect. So I'd already been wanting to basically email them and be like, by the way, (laughs) I can make this book better. I promise. (laughs) Um, so yeah, and I'm, I'm someone who really like, like, I prefer editing to first drafting um, that suits me much better i love like having the puzzle pieces down and then figuring out how to fit them together to make the prettiest picture Mm -hmm. whereas i feel like first drafting you have the puzzle they're all mixed up half of them are upside down uh you try and make a corner and you realize it's a centerpiece and i find that whole process sometimes fun but mostly quite distressing and in that process do you is your approach then to sort of just push through and get the that first draft on the on the page or on the computer and then as you say go back to the editing bit and start to rework it honestly every book is different because i'm now on book i'm currently at the same time writing books eight and nine um i yeah and i don't think i've ever written two books the same way Mm -hmm. um i'm i wish i could be someone who could just really quickly trash draft something Um, even if it's really horrible and then just step back. But what I tend to do is I trash draft for about 20 to 30,000 words. And then I step back and look at everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm also an incredibly detailed pre-planner. Like I am the Hermione Granger of writers. I have a (laughs) color coded five act spreadsheet that I fill in for most books before I begin. Um, And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm really kind of extra about that. So I think. How long does that process take you then? If it's in that much detail, that must take almost as long as. As right not really actually i think like i sit there and i really uh nail it down i do a lot of sort of pre-writing and world building just kind of noodling in a notebook for and sometimes that goes on for months and i do that while i'm writing other things i just sort of let things percolate and then when i decide it's time to you know take it off the back hob and onto the front hob um i'll spend a good it probably takes about three weeks to a month to really nail down an outline sometimes quicker sometimes slower Um, and then I do think that helps the first draft be a bit quicker. Like the fastest I've ever written a first draft was three months and that was for false hearts. 
and Goldilocks, the first draft was quite quick too. Right. Um, out of necessity, because I sold this book without writing it first, oh, okay. which was the first. <laughs> so that was just so, sold so on we... the pitch, was it then? Yeah. So um, it, it was a weird like happenstance. I work at Edinburgh Napier University as my day job. And after work one day, um, another one of Juliet's authors, James Oswald, who's like the nicest man on earth and writes the goriest crime ever, uh, <laughs> was having a, a book launch at a bookstore that's literally at the end of the road, the Edinburgh Bookshop. Sh and my mm -hmm. colleague, Daniel Shand, who's also a writer, was like, oh, are you going to go? And I was like, oh, I know I should. Like, James is lovely, but I'm also very tired. And it's like the depths of winter and it's very dark. But I was like, ah, oh, I have to say hi to James. He's so nice. And I want to support his new crime series. So I went um, and James was, you know, being the author and chatting with all the people. So I ended up chatting with um, his editor, who's Alex Clark, who heads up Wildfire, which is part of Headline. And we just had a really nice chat. And I wasn't talking about um, my books per se. I was just talking about, you know, the publishing industry and just shooting the shit. Like he went, he did his undergrad in Edinburgh. So he loves Edinburgh. And then near the end, I was like, I'm really going to regret it if I don't at least try and put myself out there. And so like at the end, I very cheekily was like, oh, you know, let me know if you if you need any thrillers. Um, and I kind of laughed awkwardly. I felt like I was incredibly awkward throughout the whole thing. <laughs> and he was like, oh, well, actually, we're looking for someone to write like a science fiction feminist thriller for us. And I was like, well, I've already written two and that's completely my jam. So I actually said, this is my jam because again, very <laughs> awkward. Uh, and he was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, I'll call your agent. And then that happened. And I went home and then psychoanalyzed every single thing I said and died inside and curled up in awkwardness. Um, and then it was like a few weeks later and it, until I eventually was like, Julia, I did a thing. <laughs> I hope this wasn't a stupid thing, but I did it. Um, and she was like, leave it with me. Uh, and then, yeah, lo and behold, they were like, yeah, send us a proposal. Um, so I wrote two chapters and a bit of an outline, uh, and it went to acquisitions after, again, they did a re revise and resubmit where they're like, the tone isn't quite right in these two chapters, like make it more literary. And I was like, I can do that. I love writing <laughs> literary, but I, I tend to kind of scale it back with thrillers. Cause you want to have that really kind of quick pace, yeah. but they were like, no, take up space you're in space you can you can you know let your metaphors fly basically so i did that and then it sold and then they wanted it six months later <laughs> wow <laughs> and i was like oh okay <laughs> and goldilocks is out at the end of the month uh, yes it is yeah on um, april 30th in the uk and uh may 5th in the us through orbit so yeah it's coming out at a time when all bookstores are closed so that's fun. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did want to ask about that. You know, how what kind of impact will this have on on book sales and stuff? Book launches, honestly, I, push back or I don't know. Like they're not pushing it back. Um, and I did kind of ask about it whether we should or not. But they've pretty much they'd already sent it to the printers, so it didn't make sense. Like we may as well put it out. Um, but I'm sure it will have an effect. I don't know how much. Um, and I try not to think about it too hard or else I kind of spiral off into a panic attack because it, it's so frustrating because it felt, I've had a weird go of publishing where like things seem to start going well and gaining momentum and then everything sort of falls apart. And that's happened twice now. And I was like, okay, third time's the charm. This is getting really good reviews. It's getting some buzz. Maybe this time publishing will finally go right for me. And then, <laughs> and then pandemic. And then it's, it's hard because you feel bad that you feel so upset by it because you know there's so many people who are much worse off this is a pandemic it's horrible people are dying but at the same time it's still just really sad like my mom was meant to fly out at the end of this month i was meant to have my first launch in london piccadilly um at waterstones i was gonna have like a little mini uk tour and i was so excited and now it's like that that's this alternate timeline that's just not gonna happen is, is that is that sort of stuff still something that could happen once lockdown lifts yeah that well is. that's what my publisher said so my publisher has been really really good where they're like we understand these are strange circumstances so what i'm kind of doing to get myself through this is i'm thinking of this as a two-part launch so the actual launch date is like a soft launch of primarily ebook and audiobook mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with maybe some print sales so like i have the goldsboro sff box um which is really cool where they're sending out like mm -hmm. orange sprayed edge ver versions and that's 
I think 500 copies. So I'll at least sell 500 copies of the hardback. <laughs> yes. Um, and otherwise, you know, whoever wants to support the independents, because there's a lot of independents and Waterstones and stuff who are still shipping things out. So hopefully some copies will move. And then the hope is, is that once the bookstores open back up and the supply chain gets back to normal, that um, the publisher will do another push and that will hopefully help make up for some of the initial lost sales. Mm -hmm. But it means like the normal, I guess, sales curve will also be a bit flattened, yeah. I suppose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I just have to hope for the best. But there's not really anything I can do except, you know, shout about it and hope that the people who pick it up like it and help spread the word for me. Well, there's only so much you can do as one author, yeah. really. We, we all certainly shout about it because we're, yeah. we are, we've been lucky enough to be given an advanced copy of it and it's really we're really enjoying it well certainly i am oh, I think yeah no I, I also very much enjoy it i kind of realized um fairly recently that that kind of near future sci-fi is something that i actually enjoy a lot more than the, than the kind of far-flung future stuff um and yeah I'm, i think it's absolutely fantastic oh, so definitely you. definitely buy anyone who's listening to this go and buy it yeah Please, please. <laughs> In fact, we've not even said what it's about. So do you want to give oh, us yeah. a, a, a brief point, pitch yeah. of... Yeah, so it's about the first all-female space mission to an exosolar planet called Cavendish, which is about 10 and a half light years away. Uh, and it's humanity's last hope because Earth is dying due to climate change. Um, and actually, these women were initially the chosen people to take this mission, but because misogyny has sort of been rearing its ugly head back on Earth... They were kicked off the project, even though Valerie Black, the head of the mission, is uh, basically Elon Musk meets Sigourney Weaver, and she financed it, but they found a loophole, and they were going to send five men instead. And so they basically, as one, were like, nope. And so they steal the spaceship because they know that they have the skills to actually reach Cavendish and make a difference. So they just take off. Um, and it's kind of, it's about, you know, going off into the expanse of space, but I think I realized afterwards, I can pretend that I intended this from the beginning, but it's a lie that Goldilocks is, you know, the habitable zone of a planet of not too hot and not too cold, but it also sort of applies to how women have to function in society. They can't be too much this or too much that they have to reach this mythical, just right, um, you know, zone that's changing every, every day. Mm -hmm. No, well, I think those themes definitely come through, and there's also a lot yeah. of. Um, I mean, I, I read, I, I did, I read something that said uh, it's sort of the Martian meets the Handmaid's Tale, which is a good yeah. pitch, and there's uh, there's also aspects of things like Interstellar in there as as well. Uh, so it is that sort of high level, uh, as Tarek says, near future sci fi type type stuff. But there's a lot of science in the book. So did you spend mm -hmm. a lot of time researching that? Yeah, it was a lot of research, and I think that was more daunting than writing the book itself because i studied english literature i have absolutely zero practical skills or science background mm. um, and i'm always interested in it and i'm pretty good at researching but i was there when you if you read the book there is a lot of science um because i wanted it to be as realistic as possible but with some caveats like i have the warp uh, theoretical warp drive mm. that does technically adhere to the laws of physics al uh came up with this theory in the 90s um, but it's unrealistic that we're going to get that anytime soon. So that's probably my one big point of departure, but everything else I tried to keep reasonably realistic. So it was, I interviewed a lot of, um, astrophysicists. I'm lucky that my friend's husband, uh, works at the Max Planck's Planck Institute and his team won the Nobel prize for, um, physics in gravitational oh, wow. waves. Oh, so I asked him questions. Good resource. Um, yeah, yeah. Good resource. and I asked, um, I also was involved in this really cool interdisciplinary project called Scotland in Space that was run through uh, the Edinburgh Futures Institute, which is a real thing, uh, and the University of Edinburgh and Napier, where they took a bunch of like writers and artists and social scientists, but mixed them up with hard scientists. And we were put in little groups and sort of brainstorm stories together. And then I was able to ask them for the science information to write it. So that w ended up being sort of like the trial run. And there was a woman in my group, Beth, Dr. Beth Biller, who's also an astrophysicist who specializes in exosolar planets. So I took her out for dinner once I had sold this book and I was like, please help me, <laughs> please. And so she gave me like a short list of like, here's the stars that would be most likely to have an exosolar planet. And then I chose one and then she um, calculated 
what it would look like going around the sun, how long would a year be, uh, how big does the sun have to be, all of that stuff, uh, which I think I put in chapter four or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, and so that was all thanks to her. And then another big thing I had to research was surprisingly algae and spirulina <laughs> is really big in the book because that's probably what will eat in space because it doesn't need soil. And so uh, there was someone else in the Scotland in space uh, project who gave me kind of the initial push. Um, and then my a good friend of mine, Dr. Sinead Collins, I realized belatedly is basically Naomi, except not an astronaut. So she runs a lab at the University of Edinburgh that looks at uh, algae in the context of climate change. So she did a science read for me, like I had a draft and then I highlighted the very sciencey bits in yellow and she went through um, and checked everything for me. And even if she didn't know it, she knew how to find it. So I feel reasonably certain that that's realistic. And then I still had to ask more people things like I, I out of the blue emailed a professor of space law um, to ask if you could legally steal an exosolar planet. And he didn't get back to me for a bit. And then he was like, hello, do you still do this? <laughs> and I was like, yes. And so he sent me back this long essay and he was really into it. He was so like fascinated by, you know, thinking mm -hmm. about whether you could steal an exosolar planet. So I had a lot of fun and I found Lots of people were really just generous with their time. So I also emailed a, um, my agent's assistant's mom is a doctor who looks after space uh, astronaut health for NASA. Wow. And then I emailed her questions, which she answered. And then she was like, let me just CC my friend, John, who is the former head of life sciences at the Johnston Space Center. <laughs> and so uh, I had to ask him a question that I can't say here because it's spoilery, mm -hmm. but must have really weirded him out out of context um, and things like that. So yeah, I learned a lot from it. So the science, any science mistakes are mine, um, but I, I tried to do the best I could to be reasonably realistic. I think that does come through in, in the writing. I think you get a lot more respect and you get a lot more, um, you get a lot more out of it, I think, if you can, if there's that much research has gone into it, it feels a lot more real. It ha you know, it, the whole thing hangs as a story much, much more cleaner if it's not just made up throwing things around. And I mean, I had no idea there was that much research involved. That's absolutely insane. That's and, not even, there's still even more. I just figured I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> but when you go back and you, and you and you sit down, you say, right, I'm going to write this book and I've got six months to do it and I've got all this research to do and I'd like to plan things out pretty in depth. That's a lot of work to do in a short space of time. Yeah. And how much, because we've chatted to folk before in the past and they've said that they don't like to do too much planning because it takes some of the spontaneity out or they, they almost get a bit bored writing down the stuff they've, they've thought about the scene so often when it comes yeah. to writing and they kind of lose that kind of mojo. Is that something you've, you've ever found or is it the opposite for you? Sometimes, but I just, I'm too anxious to go in there just and flail around. That suits people really well where basically their first draft is their outline and mm -hmm. then they probably chuck out a lot of it and go back and kind of start over again. Um, but that just doesn't work for me. Every time I've tried, I tend to kind of sputter out around the 30 to 40K mark. Um, which I call my wobble point. <laughs> and whenever like I teach students and then they'll get to, you know, about a third of the way through whatever project they're doing and they'll freak out. And I'm like, ah, you've hit your wobble point. Yeah. I see. Um, so for me, I don't, I do have intense like spreadsheets, but they're still not terribly detailed. Like I have the main tent poles of where I need to go. And I know what the ending is and what I'm working towards. And I took a page out of Victoria Schwab's book because she writes the ending quite soon after, or first sometimes. Right. So I wrote the first right. two chapters, and then I wrote the last epilogue because I knew what image I wanted to end on, and that was really mm -hmm. helpful. I ended up rewriting the epilogue when I got to it, but that closing mm -hmm. image was still the same. Um, and it just it helped, too, to know, like, okay, I, I usually follow loosely um, John York's Into the Woods structure. I think that's the best. It's a, like, set to text on our masters um and it's just it follows most of the stories that we already know so it gives you a shape but i find the creativity isn't the shape it's the filling in of the shape mm -hmm. and giving it color and texture and um making it realistic and bringing the characters alive so i find the opposite i find the the structure gives me the freedom to actually you know fill in those blanks mm -hmm. and that's what i find most creative i mean i read i read something actually by um you know charlie strauss the the mm -hmm. author he he said something last week i think on twitter which was um you know he's anyone can take the ideas that he's got he doesn't really you know 
go and take the ideas. That's not the that's not the hard part. That's not the skill. The skill is turning that into something, uh, mm. uh, you know, readable and something that people yeah. enjoy. And that that's sort of linked to what you were saying there. I think about you know you yeah. can, you can put the tent poles down, but it's actually in the writing process that obviously. Yeah. Really I actually comes responded to that tweet. I think uh, I did like a quote retweet because technically I have two books about five women in space out this year because my book out in August is Seven so, Devils, yeah. which is uh, mm. co-written with my friend Elizabeth May, and that's a lot more far future, like more Star Warsy, and. Technically, yeah, it's another five women in space. It talks about, you know, smashing the patriarchy in space, but it takes a radically different approach. It's completely tonally different. The plot is very different. Um, and it it's just, I was worried about it at first because I was like, oh, no, are people going to think these books are too similar? But I don't think you could read one, one right after the other and you'd see some of my same interests, mm -hmm. but you'd read two very different books. And mm -hmm. um, what is that like writing a a book with someone else how, how does that process work for you it's a we were basically learning by doing the in the first book so the second book's more interesting because we kind of know how we function mm -hmm. um so we do it all via google docs so we can see each other um writing in live time although i tend to write more in the morning and she's like a, a night owl so she tends to write in the evening so i'll wake up and see what she did mm -hmm. so it's like the one time when the writing fairies will like arrive <laughs> which is nice and then you can have a little chat box on the side so if i have a question i can be like elizabeth help um or i'll leave her notes being like please make this dialogue better um this is terrible and that sort of thing mm -hmm. or what do we need to do here and so it's nice because you're not doing it as alone um, and I'm really proud of the book that we wrote together because there's we kind of vaguely took the lead on characters. Um, so I vaguely wrote a bit more of Chloe and she wrote a bit more of Eris, but our fingerprints are not absolutely everything. And I've just finished uh, proofing it today. So I've, I've read it for the last time. And there's like big parts of it where I can't remember who wrote what, mm -hmm. which is, I think, a good sign. Um, so yeah, I find it really interesting. Um, probably the thing to keep in mind if you want to co-write with someone is make sure you know what each other's like actual processes are so like i'm very i'm the tortoise and elizabeth's the hare so i now know that i'll be kind of slowly plodding on and she won't be writing for a few days and then i'll get anxious but then you know she'll catch up with me and write 20k in a week so now that i tr i trust her enough to catch up so i don't get as freaked out and she likewise if she gets ahead of me she knows that i'll be you know trotting along and catch up eventually that sounds like a really interesting way of doing a, of doing a book together because I think we've chatted to folk before who have done books with someone else and they've always kind of split the workload into world world building or kind of character stuff but that seems you guys seem really really meshed you know and and, and when you write something you then just wait for her to catch up and do a redraft almost of your chapter and you'll go yeah, back yeah. and redraft so it she'll, again. she'll edit my stuff and sometimes quite heavily and then if there's something where I'm like oh I don't like that you changed that and I remember it enough to change it back then I'll change it back but about probably 80 percent of the time I'm really I'm fine with whatever she changes and likewise I'll rewrite over her stuff um, or we'll sometimes kind of do little plans. So at the moment, I'm a couple chapters ahead of her in book two, but I've written like little notes of what needs to happen and the chapters she'll catch up on. And she can ignore that as long as, you know, it still fits in what with roughly with what I've written ahead of her mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So yeah, it's very symbiotic. And mm -hmm. I think it ends up being more than the sum of its parts. Like, I don't think I would have tried to do something with five point of view characters and flashbacks and such like, huge stakes because Goldilocks is even though it has huge stakes it's quite claustrophobic it's just Naomi in third person except for the prologue and the epilogue which is an unnamed first person narrator and you find out who it is at the end um but it's very tight and claustrophobic whereas Seven Devils is really like expansive mm -hmm. and so do you do you when you're doing that at the start of the process are you just chatting about and coming up with the idea yourself and then you sort of split it up as you, and say right let's just go for yeah. it or, yeah so we have we have a big chat and then because i love to pre-plan i'll do um we had to do a synopsis for book two anyway which we kind of did together we met up in a pub and like chatted out loud and then i was the person actually typing and so now i've taken that synopsis and i've started kind of ex accordion in it out into actual chapters and i've probably taken the lead on that a little bit but she'll 
she's better at doing stuff like the copy edits and catching the little persnickety bits, which mm -hmm. by that point, I my eyes just glaze over and I'm not as good at it. So um, I think like our strengths and weaknesses balance each other really well so that, yeah, it ends up being stronger. But it's some of my favorite parts of writing is when we start brainstorming, we'll be like, oh, but we could do this or, oh, this would be even cooler for mm -hmm. our characters. Good. And it's fun. It's like you have your own inbuilt number one fan as well yeah, they're no, just I, think, as I, think, I mean that's me and Tarek have written not a book together but we've written some screenplays together and stuff and it is that, that process of being able to bounce ideas off each other is something yeah. that's that is, and you really definitely good. do find things you wouldn't get by yourself yeah, I think definitely. yeah for sure and I ended up being able to do that a little bit with Goldilocks because I knew it was such a tight deadline. Um, I ended up working really closely with my editor, Ella. So I sent her and Alex the like color coded spreadsheet and we had a, a, a chat about it. And they pointed out some things in that version that just didn't make sense. And, um, and we figured out fixes and things like that. But it, it was nice to get the sign off of, okay, we like the general shape of this. And then about every 20,000 words, I sent it to her and I was like, please help. Like, is this what you want? Am I on the right track? Do you see any obvious things I should fix now so it doesn't have these huge repercussions? Um, and I'm so glad I did because when I sent her the first, say, 25K, um, my flashbacks at that point were just kind of vague flashbacks. Like they didn't really have a point. Um, and she found the bits on the spaceship much more engaging. Whereas I, when I was writing it, I was like, oh, the spaceship bit, I don't know, it seems undercooked, but these flashbacks are great. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, never mind. Um, and so I realized I had to actually create a subplot for the flashbacks, which is Naomi trying to get into NASA, um, which wasn't there initially. So I had to throw out about 15K of my flashbacks, which was painful, but it saved me so much heartache down the line because yeah. I didn't have vague flashbacks throughout. And then when I sent her the 50K, it wasn't as big of edit notes. And then by it meant by the end, by the time I sent her the whole manuscript in August, we didn't have to do like a huge structural edit. It was actually relatively minor, mm -hmm. um, which was nice. Because sometimes I'll have to rewrite about 70% of yeah. the book in the first structural edit. And you're like, <laughs> oh, man. You mentioned already that you currently lecture at Edinburgh Napier mm -hmm. University on the Creative Writing Master's course, is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And is that a course that you did when you were younger and you wanted to, to work in, or is that just something, like, is, is that something you think is quite important for people to do? I think it's, it's not essential, but it can help. So I'm never going to say you have to go study creative writing, because one, it can be a lot of money, um, especially if you're an international student, for example, and we have a few Americans, we have a Thai student this year. Um, but I do think it can help you just professionalize your practice and force you to finish stuff and get you used to learning how to take critique um, and push yourself. And so I think it can be really valuable. Um, I didn't do the math. I didn't do that master's. I did a master's at the University of Aberdeen. Um, but it was a weird experience for me because I did the master's after I'd already sold five books to publishers. Right. Okay. Um, and I did it because I really wanted to get into teaching because I knew that would be like the perfect day job, which it is. Um, but it was kind of a strange experience doing the master's. And like for the first trimester, I didn't tell anyone I was published because I didn't want to like be that one asshole being like, well, I'm published. <laughs> like, I don't need to listen to you. Um, but I told them halfway through and then it, it did get slightly awkward for some of the students. And I wonder if I should have just kept it quiet, but um, it was fine. But because that, that master's was sort of half literature and half creative writing. So there wasn't actually as much creative writing in it as I would have liked, perhaps. Um, and it was also a weird experience because my dad died midway through it. So sadly, I didn't get to give it probably as much effort and concentration as I could have otherwise. Um, but I'm still glad I did it because it meant I was able to get this job at Napier, where I'd been basically a guest lecturer once or twice. So after my very first book, David Bishop um, had found, I don't know how he found me, um, but he invited me to come speak to the students. And it was like my first ever uh, gig as, a, as an author, which was fun. Uh, and I came back another time too. And then I saw the job go up and I meet, but it asked for a PhD, which I didn't have. So I immediately emailed him and was like, can I try anyway? I want this job so bad. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, try. And we'll see if we can get the PhD bit wavered because you've written five books. I think that should count as equivalent experience to a PhD, but it was really hard for them to do that. And so the first time um, I wasn't able, like I applied, but they still wanted the PhD. 
but they didn't find anyone to interview. So then I had, I ended up having to apply like three times for this job. Um, and then I ended up interviewing and I got it and, and it started out just being like 0.3 of a full-time role. So it was one and a half days and now I'm at uh, 0.5. So it's half of a full-time job. Um, and it's a really great balance because it means I still have half of the week to focus on my own writing mm-hmm. um, or stuff like this. Um, but the other half, I'm really able to, like, it all feeds into my own writing and I love helping other students and seeing them, like, have that spark when something really hits for them or seeing, like, how much they change from, like, September until they turn in their major project and seeing them just, like, blossom most of the time is really, really satisfying. And so I think we really push them hard too. like, we make them write at least one new short story every week, pretty much right. 500 words. And we don't do the peer review method because we think you could basically ask your friends or find writing groups and do that for free. Mm-hmm. Why pay, you know, four to five figures to come to a master's when that's also just not how publishing works. You don't like have a round table mm-hmm. of everyone yeah. telling you what they think about your book, like 17 people um, that can kind of give you, I think too many, too many voices and then you'll start to doubt yourself. So what we do instead is um, sort of a master class. So everyone writes a short story and then we go through and they upload it to a forum so people can read each other's stuff. Uh, And we choose four every week that have interesting problems and we'll choose a different one so everyone gets chosen eventually. And so everyone comes in, they write a critical self-reflection. So like what what was your purpose in writing this? What techniques did you use? What do you think's working? What's not working? And so it forces them to look at their work objectively and figure figure out solutions without us having to tell them necessarily, because mm-hmm. that'll save them a lot of time and um, I'll let them recreate success rather than sort of like lucking into a successful story and not knowing why it worked. And then um, they'll read out their story, they'll read out their CSR, and we give them feedback on the CSR and the story. So we'll be like, oh, well, you didn't notice you used this technique or blah, blah, blah. And then um, it's like a back and forth dialogue and everyone else is listening, but it's more like how it works with an editor and a writer. So, I mean, it it does sound, you know, really useful because there is, I think there is a school of thought, and I've said this before in the podcast, where some people just think, oh, you you can either write or you can't write. And it's not something that can be taught. But, you know, that that sort of process I can see is incredibly valuable for, as you say, being able to objectively assess something that you're writing, understanding why you're writing it, understanding why it doesn't work or does work. And I think that is some definitely something that can be taught and isn't yeah. something that would be innate to some to some people. Really. Exactly, yeah. Because, yeah. I, mean, I mean, writing's not just putting the words on, on, on the paper. As, as you say, it is about having to evaluate what you've written, how to improve it. And, and if you want to make a career out of it, it is, it's more than just writing a perfect story. And, and so, yeah, I can totally see having help with that side of the process being a really good thing. Yeah, because um, it is a craft and I think it can be learned. Like it's the same with drawing and art. Like everyone says, oh, you know, I just can't draw just stick figures. But it's more about the time spent. Mm -hmm. And with drawing, you can kind of see the linear progression a bit easier sometimes because you can be like, well, I couldn't draw symmetrical eyes to save my life. Mm -hmm. And now a year later, I can do that. And this looks more like an actual face. Um, whereas you can't see that as easily with writing sometimes, which can be frustrating. But I do think like, even if you have say a little bit of innate talent, that's only going to get you so far, you're going to probably, you know, hit a wall at some point. And if you don't have the work ethic to push past it, you're really going to struggle. Whereas someone who maybe starts out like less quote unquote talented, but puts in the time and, you know, reads critically and writes a shit ton and just really pushes themselves will probably surpass that person with, you know, the natural talent. Mm -hmm. Um, And being a writer is a myriad of skills. It's not just like sitting in your office and typing away. It's also a lot of public speaking like this. I used to be really bad at it and get really stressed out. But four years of lecturing has at least, like, if I stumble over my words, I don't get as flustered by it anymore. I just kind of roll with it and find my way again. But it's also, yeah, having to sell yourself, having to navigate the like radical ups and downs of the industry you have to be really resilient. And that's all stuff we teach on the masters. I do a whole course called authorship where like, I'll, I'll show them my income stream since 2013 with like bar graphs and pie charts. I get really into the pie charts and we talk about like, how do you read a publishing contract? How do you pitch an agent? 
how do you get mentally resilient? What can you do when things go wrong so that it doesn't completely crush you? Because I think that's something that's really underestimated because you think of writing as your dream. And then when it, the dream comes true, you realize it's a job and yeah. dreams can also <laughs> kind of crumble a little bit too. And it can be easy to get cynical. I've seen a lot of, like I've been cynical in the past um, and I can be off and on. Um, and, but you have to remember too, that it's meant to be fun. It's meant to be a joy. And if you can find a way to, weather the storms and still have fun you'll be miles ahead of the people who you know get quite bitter yeah no definitely I mean, it it sounds like a yeah if i had the money and time it sounds like no, a it yeah. to me pretty much <laughs> yeah, exactly. i know well it is it is staff funded for scottish students so it's it's usually more affordable for for mm -hmm. scottish students and um, i think even uh, the, the parts i would find the most interesting i think would be the stuff like the kind of behind the scenes bits of the writing that nobody ever really teaches you, like, mm -hmm. you know, the income stuff or the how to keep going, how to push through the movie. That's the kind of stuff that no one ever thinks about when they think. I think a lot mm -hmm. of people are like, oh, writing, lovely. I'll sit in my garden, have a cup of tea, and I'll write a novel, you know, it's, it'd be wonderful. But there's so all the practical stuff, mm -hmm. which no one yeah. really talks about. Would be really yeah, important. and I wasn't really taught that in either my undergrad or my master's. So it meant when mm -hmm. I was trying to sell stuff, I felt kind of lost and I had to just like Google and, you know, hope I could find my way in but so that's why I basically put into the masters all the stuff I wish 20 or 21 year old me had known um, yeah. and if they can learn from my mistakes and avoid them then that'll help them awesome yeah, definitely and uh, I think I'm right in saying that the Goldilocks film rights have been optioned is that is that correct? they uh, I have a film agent right. and as far as I know they're circulating around and they were like a couple of vague nibbles from right production companies but i haven't had an update in a little while plus i think hollywood's currently on yeah, pause absolutely. so yes. who knows? i do think of my books it probably has the largest shot of getting optioned and maybe made which would be really cool i have had another book optioned um but i'm pretty sure the rights have expired now and i never got to announce it which was really annoying oh. i'm so excited <laughs> it was like it was such a cool thing, and I still don't think I'm allowed to say who it was, but I can say it was for False Hearts, okay. oh, um, cool. which was my other kind of near future cyberpunk mm -hmm. book. Um, so, yeah, it would be really nice, and I've I've done like my fan casting. I would really love it if Liv Tyler could be Naomi because she's had to play an astronaut's wife left behind on Earth twice, <laughs> and I just want Liv Tyler to go to space. <laughs> so Hollywood, if you're listening, please let me send Liv Tyler to space. Um, but yeah, I don't, I have no idea. I've, I've learned to just kind of view it as like a fun extra. It would be amazing. Um, but if it happens, it happens. If not, yeah. the book still exists. It's not going anywhere. And is there any chance of you writing anything else in the future, apart from books? You know, would you work on scripts yourself to try and get into that? I would like to, yeah. Like, I keep saying I'm going to, and then I just sort of, like, drag my feet. Like, I had a, a different film agent for False Hearts, and I went to L.A. just to visit my aunt, because she lives there anyway. And I was like, I'm going to go to Creative Artists Agency, because I won't be able to ever again, probably. So I went there, and I met... John Kassir and it was like the most surreal experience of my life I like sat in the swanky lobby and like he shook my hand and he had like the very firm handshake and he talked a mile <laughs> a minute like a Hollywood executive and he just say things like as you know we rep George Clooney <laughs> and you're like, what am I doing here uh, and like you know it was a little bit of like blowing smoke up my ass of like oh yeah we'll totally sell this and they did eventually, but it didn't get developed or anything. But it was still like the funnest experience yeah. ever. So that's just sort of how I view it. I'm like, if I get to talk to any producers and I get to like daydream about this, and if they give me some random money, <laughs> I'm not gonna say no. But yeah, like I have, I have another sort of near future thriller that I originally wrote as another Pacifica book, but for various reasons, that's not gonna happen. So I've reimagined it, um, and I would like to. I think write it as a pilot and I've been reading pilots and stuff, but when it comes to actually starting, I just keep getting terrified and I don't really know. Like, I think I need to just start and do it, but it, it does, it's similar, but it is a different set of tools. And yeah, so I think I feel, like a, I feel like a beginner again. So um, yeah. I think it would be good for me, but I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> Is, is having a film agent something you would, you would you recommend people do? You know, Because I think a lot of people just use their same agent to deal with the film rights as well as the book rights. But you kind of No, they're different usually. Most of the time, so 
the agent or the publisher in this case the publisher has the right so they're the ones who found the film agent oh, because okay, they don't okay. know how to they don't know how to actually you know pitch it to hollywood themselves so they usually partner with somebody so right okay. now my agent is emily hayward whitlock um who seems good i haven't spoken to her directly though i've, <laughs> I've never spoken to her um i've just heard like secondhand oh yeah she's pitched this to these people and that sort of thing and it comes back through my publisher so yeah. um but yeah i'd like it but who knows but yeah i really should just knuckle down and try and play around with the screenplay and see what happens cool cool and so so you've got seven devils coming out uh you've got goldilocks coming out the end yeah, of April imminently. Seven, <laughs> seven devils uh toward, towards the end of summer um is there anything else in the pipeline that you're able to well there's a uh, sequel to seven devils which we're working on which will either be out in 2021 or 2022 depending on when we finish it mm -hmm. um and then there they said basically that if goldilocks sells well enough there's a chance i could write more books in that same vein um or with the same characters because it's it stands very well as a standalone so if nothing else happens i think it would finish on its own quite nicely but i do have ideas to kind of put it out to three books, which I think would be really nice. So I'd like to do that. And then I'm also working on an uh, epic fantasy with dragons, um, where I've sent a partial manuscript to my agent and she gave me notes. So I'm slowly editing those at the moment. So stuff in the works, but yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Always good to have stuff in the works. That's what I've learned. I'm like, things can fall apart in publishing quite yeah. often. So you, you have to just have something else in the pipeline. And then don't put all your eggs in one basket and don't put all your hopes into one project mm -hmm. because it can be really easy to get them dashed that way. Well, I mean, yeah. I think going back to what you were saying about learning, you know, I think part of the process is definitely, you know, learning how to deal with rejections from agents. And also I imagine once even sometimes your book will get published, but then it won't do anything. And that must yeah. be a horrible mm -hmm. That's a horrible initially. thing because I've had that a few times where like it sold okay, but it didn't really get momentum. It just kind of came out and that was mm. it. But the thing that's horrible is like they never tell you. They just kind of mm. let you slowly work it out for yourself <laughs> that it hasn't done <laughs> what they hoped. And it's it's almost like sometimes publishing can be too nice. Whereas sometimes I'd rather them just sit me down and be like, look, we tried a thing. It didn't work. This is a shame. Um, but we still really like you and your writing, so let's yeah. brainstorm what we can do. But quite often, yeah. because publishing has so many writers that are so keen um, to go through the system, that publishing has a tendency to just kind of be like, well, that didn't work, and then they wash your hands, their mm -hmm. hands of you, um, which I understand from a business point of view, but from a personal point yeah. of view, it's really, really painful. Yeah. Um, and so I wish more publishers would be like, well, we really love this writer, so let's actually develop this writer and try something mm -hmm. new and work together. Um, which I maybe seem to have with my new publishers, but I also am not going to trust it necessarily. No. I love them dearly, but <laughs> I've learned not to trust publishing, and that's probably for the best. It can sound a little cynical, but... What was the last book that you read? Well, I'm currently reading probably the worst book to read right now, which is Wanderers by Chuck Oh, Lindick, right. Yeah, I've read that one. Yeah. <laughs> which is about a pandemic, yes. Yeah. But um, he gave me such a nice quote, and I've been meaning to read Wanderers for ages because I've liked some of his other stuff I've read. And um, I enjoy his Twitter, and I've known him for years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's brilliant, but I am, I'm going to have to read something very light and fluffy after this. <laughs> um, and also on audiobook, I'm re-listening to Fool's Errand by Robin Hobb because Robin Hobb is my like favorite author of all time. I'm her biggest fangirl. So I'm reading, re-listening re re to that for comfort. Cool. cool. And what was the last film you watched? Oh, what was the last film? I watched a TV show. We just finished Beforeners, which is a Norwegian show on HBO. Oh, yeah. Um, about like time travelers who kind of come into contemporary times and it sort of has parallels to kind of refugees and how they're treated. Um, and I found that quite interesting. Um, in terms of films, I don't think I've watched a film in a little while. It's mostly just been TV, a lot of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. So <laughs> it's also nice. I also really like RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> you need these sort of things at, at this time, yeah. I think. These are the sort of shows. I, think, yeah, I think I don't yeah. really have that much uh concentration for films at the moment i tend to kind we just, of we watched um love is blind recently oh, yeah. which is just total trash but it is so entertaining and i think there's something about 
when the whole world is so serious right now, it's quite nice to watch something just very lighthearted crap. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and then the last, the very last bit is a sort of either or, uh, just pick one of them. So first one, uh, The Martian or Interstellar? Oh, God. I guess it, it's a hard one because I really like aspects of both. I think I enjoy the kind of aesthetics and tone and sort of artistry of Interstellar, but then aspects of the plot left me a little bit confused mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. or that went yeah, a bit the- too far out there. <laughs> Yeah, the I whole think, ending, I think, kind of falls apart for me in the last 20 minutes Yeah, or so. yeah, same. I was so into and I loved, like, that Dust Bowl feeling of the beginning yeah. and life on Earth. I loved that. Whereas I love the science in The Martian, and I think it has quite a tight plot of, like, basically Robinson Crusoe on Mars. Um, but s- sometimes the humor didn't quite land for me. So I would try to, I would like to mesh them into one baby. Mixed with Handmaid's <laughs> Tale, which is what I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I'll do a one more film comparison, I think. Would you go for either Arrival or 2001? Arrival. I loved that movie yeah, so much. That, and I love the yeah. novella, too. I've I've been a big fan of Ted Chiang for ages. I've not read the book it's based on, but the film itself is brilliant. It, it's like a short novella, um, so you can read it in an afternoon. I recommend oh, cool. his, his collection, Stories of Your Life and Others. is just fantastic. Okay. Brilliant. I, I thought when I watched Arrival for a second time, I think I actually enjoyed it more, because when you know what... Yeah. The, how the stories are un- unfolding without giving anything away. It, you you really appreciate the intricacy of everything fitting together the way it it's does. So and it is, clever. It's so yeah. clever. And it's good seeing that, how how he does it in the written format too, because it's all oh, okay. there. It's all there. And even just like some of the stylistic choices of like tense, like the tense that he writes in actually kind of gives you a heads up. It's it's extraordinary. It's so oh, good. cool. Oh, I'll have to give that a read. Yeah, yeah definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> I said actually last week we should have changed these, but um, in normal times, <laughs> TV or cinema? The moment it's TV, just because my concentration <laughs> is rubbish. But I really love like going to a cinema and knowing that you have to turn your phone off and you're sitting in the dark. And um, mm-hmm. I go to like the Vue at Ocean Terminal here in Edinburgh that has like oh yeah, yeah. Big seats. Seats. The comfy yeah. seats, the big so seats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's something about like that whole experience of going to the cinema that is just delightful my dad used to take us to the cinema all the time but he was so broke that he would like only buy two tickets and then he would go in with them and then come back out and i had to take the torn ticket stub and pretend it already been in so that all three of us could go <laughs> that and sounds my brother very, and my dad that's the sort of the thing cinema. my dad would do as well I'm yeah <laughs> and then we'd stay for two we'd like because we'd go to another movie after the first one it finished <laughs> or we go to the Super Saver Cinema where tickets were only two dollars. So that's where I saw the Matrix twelve times in the theater. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and Batman and Robin twelve times oh, in the dear. theater. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a form of torture. <laughs> I'm so fond of that trash of a film just because of that. I think I loved it as a kid, but I haven't had the, I, it. It, was it actually like, watch it again, but. Oh. It's kind of worth rewatching again because it's just so campy, and Mister Freeze speaks in nothing but like dad jokes. <laughs> it's yeah, so good. it's a, a one liner. So whole everything yeah, he says yeah, yeah. is kind of built exactly. Yeah. It's so um, funny. Would you prefer to read a real book or an ebook? I actually mostly read ebooks now um, because I just find it more comfortable. Like you can prop prop it on the pillow and just like tap it yeah. and it's to the point now where if i'm reading a paper book and i'm really really tired like on a plane i will try and tap the paper that, I, i've done exactly <laughs> the same thing yeah, it's, it's, or, yeah. or like the dictionary bit in a, an ebook you can yeah, yeah. Word, oh, yeah. i love that i feel like i've learned so many new words yeah. because i can't mm-hmm. just be like what the heck is that word and then you highlight it um, but I still, I gripe about this all the time, but I really wish that the publishing industry would be more like the music industry where you could buy like the beautiful hardback first edition and get the ebook free. Yeah. Cause I would, yeah, buy, would I would buy so many beautiful hardbacks, but I just know that I find them uncomfortable to read. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I can't justify paying more for, uh, something I'm probably not going to read. Whereas yeah. yeah, if, if they just threw in the ebook, I would buy so many first editions. I mean, I, yeah, I think that's a, a great idea. And also I've, I've thought the same for sort of comics as well. It would be a great, yeah. great thing to do as well. If you buy the, the hard copy, but you can then read it on, you know, on your phone or whatever if you don't have it it's, it's a much yeah, easier especially if yeah. they did it like if you buy it from an independent or something yeah like it would be yeah. so good for independent bookstores because so i don't know why it hasn't happened 
I mean, I imagine that that would have quite a big boost on hardback sales. It would, yeah, because no one buys hardbacks. Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, whereas, yeah, I would, I'd love to buy hardbacks because I think they're so beautiful, and I love this move to having, like, book as object, and Mm -hmm. the hardbacks are getting prettier, Um, especially something like Goldsboro Books, where they do, like, beautiful, special, like, sprayed edges and foil. Yeah, they're they're really nice. uh, Gorgeous. So, yeah. If anyone in publishing is out there, why can't it happen? <laughs> okay, and the last one, would you rather uh, go to a fancy restaurant or get a takeaway? Takeaway. I'm a simple person at heart. And I also, <laughs> also the benefit of takeaway is you usually get like three meals out of it. It's That's great. True, yeah, yeah if you always order way too much and then it's all in your fridge for yeah. And I like, like, I went to a fancy um, restaurant for like my anniversary because it was our 10 year anniversary. And it was really nice, but also like you have to do that really awkward, like trying to get the bill thing or wondering, like we were set, it's like a restaurant that always has the same um, menu for everyone. And someone sat down next to us 20 minutes later, yet they were finished before us. And we're like, we ordered the same thing. And it started getting us <laughs> really irritated and yeah. kind of ruined the experience a little bit for us. Which, like we had to try and grab someone for about 20 minutes before we could get the bill. And it costs like, annoying, yeah. yeah, it costs like three times as much. And I found it slightly stressful. Whereas a takeaway, you're in your own home. It's all pretty chill. Yeah. You can watch whatever yeah, while you're eating Netflix it. Netflix or whatever. Yeah. 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 It's great. Well, that was a really, really good chat. I, I think my favorite part of that was the creative writing stuff, which I know we've chatted to people before who've done some teaching or been on these courses, but um, I think the practical stuff that her course teaches, I can see being really useful for people. Yeah, no, it, it, it really it op- opened my eyes. I mean, obviously, I know that these courses, from speaking to other people that we've had on, these courses obviously are of great use, but I think that was the first time we really got into depth about what sort of things you actually learn in these courses that that's useful. Um, one thing I don't agree with Laura about is that it's <laughs> time to watch Batman and Robin again. That's the only thing I would disagree with. <laughs> one of my it's most her... hated films. <laughs> Which is, as the world's the world's biggest fan of Batman, that's saying something. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, but I do agree with what she was saying about hardbacks. You know, it's something I've thought about, as I mentioned, mainly with comics, I suppose, but why don't you get an e-book if you pay more for a book? You know, if you paid a couple of extra pounds for the book, then it should come with the e-book with it. Um, and that would encourage people to buy the print versions of the books, I think. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, I, you know, you buy a hardback book, often it's 12 to 20 mm. quid for the for for a book compared to what five to eight quid for the for the soft for the paperback mm-hmm. um you could you could easily have an ebook with the hardback copy as a incentive because i would imagine hardback sales are not that big mm-hmm. you know most people wait for the paperback yeah. and that would be a really good incentive to get people to buy the hardback early on yeah i mean I so think... yeah i think it'd be, it'd be good. the same way you, they do with vinyl yeah exactly exactly that so um yeah it's i uh, don't know if it'll ever happen like we said, they do make a lot of money out of their ebooks, so maybe it's just yeah, going to they don't want true. to go down. I don't know. But anyway, uh, thanks very much to Laura for coming on the podcast. We really appreciate that. We really do genuinely love Goldilocks, and it would be great if you could go out and pick that, pick a copy of that up because it's really worth a read. And at the moment, yeah. when many of us are trapped in the house, it would be the perfect, perfect thing to be reading at the moment. Do not let her film recommendations put you off. Her, her <laughs> <laughs> We're joking, Laura. Is, We're joking. <laughs> I, I, I haven't seen the Batman and Robin in a long time, but I loved it as a kid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's a terrible film. That, it's a terrible this is the end of the podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> Mark just killed me. Yeah. No, but in all seriousness, this is the last in the present series of the podcast. So um, if you've not heard our earlier episodes, either in this uh, season or the previous two seasons, then go and check that out. There's lots of great guests. Richard Morgan, Sarah Pimbra, Mike Carey, a couple of times. Um, Mark Billingham, Peter James. Uh, there's, there's loads, Tim Levin, loads and loads of great guests. And it really has taught us a lot about writing. And it's also really just interesting to hear about how some of these great stories have come together. So so please do check that out. 
However, we will be back uh, soon with season four. We already have some episodes recorded and we've got guests lined up, so we're very excited about that. And we also have some other plans in the pipeline, which we hope will come to fruition, which would be very exciting and we'll give you more details of that as soon as we can on our social media. Which is uh, Twitter. You can get in touch with us there. It is at right underscore gear. So please send us a tweet, send us a message, get in touch with us. You can send us an email, as always, to podcast at rightgear.co.uk. And as Marco says, we are hoping to have some exciting news soon. So watch those spaces. Anything will be announced on our Twitter page or Facebook or Instagram, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, stay in touch. We'd love to hear from you. And we'll be back as soon as possible. But in the meantime, main thing is please stay safe. uh, And we hope to speak to you very soon. See you later. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button, and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK Page One, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.